So today we're just going to go over, it's kind of just going to be a study session today. We don't really have a chapter to go over. Um, so I'm just going to kind of run through the contract a little bit. Um, the wonderful family and kind of just, if I want to say something about one of the other contracts, I'll just kind of bring it up as we get to it. Uh, besides that, I'm just going to kind of run through some bullet points of some stuff that I might have not covered that I um, kind of thought about later or some stuff that I did cover that I just kind of want to make sure y'all know because uh, it might be a little bit important. So, um, one thing to remember about the contracts is that uh, three things that are every contract, uh, it's kind of like, we call them like the three P's of a contract, is the parties, the property, and the price. So, those are going to be the first three, the parties, the property, and the price. Those are in every contract. Um, there is other stuff that's in every contract, but that's kind of like, that's what we like to say as far as the required elements for a contract, is parties, property, and price. Uh, how we said that you have to use these forms. If your buyer uh, wants to just write it down on something and give it to you, or if the uh, seller wants to write it down on a piece of paper and just hand it to you and use that contract instead, you're technically allowed to if they require it. However, kind of the three things they have to have on there anyway is the parties, the property, and the price. Uh, they don't have to put in about leases if they don't have anything, even though it's in every contract. Uh, you know, they, they can't just say, my house will be sold for this much because what is the house, who is it going to? You have to put in, my house at blank is being sold to this person for this much. So that's the three things you would at least are be required is the parties, the property, and the price. Um, in paragraph two here, um, again, this is the property and this includes all the improvements and accessories. And I remember this is everything that is permanently installed and built in. Um, and then also the accessories, same sort of thing. It's going to have stuff that's built in. So window shades, draperies, rods, door keys, uh, mailbox keys, stuff like that that's important that you can't really take with you. You can't take the door keys with you. You can't take the mailbox keys. Uh, those are stuff that you have to be at the house or have to be left at the house, sorry. Um, but it's not going to be anything portable. Uh, that's not required. So if they have like a, a microwave, that's not required. Um, I know me and my wife are getting a portable dishwasher. Uh, we don't have a spot in our house for a dishwasher, but you can kind of put it in a portable dishwasher. That would technically be personal property because we're not like installing it into the into the house where it can't be moved. It's just a little portable thing you can plug in and use and take out. So stuff like that, that would not be considered, or that's not part of this property section because this is the stuff that is uh, referred to as like the real property. So anything portable, that doesn't count here. It's just the stuff that's kind of permanently installed. Uh, number three. So we have the, the sales price, and we all know that there's the cash uh, down payment, and then the addendums or the, the financing and then the sale price. Now, remember, these are the three things that you will need an addendum for. So if you're doing either seller financing, loan assumption, or third party financing, you're going to need an addenda attached to the contract as well. You can't just have, uh, you can't just put third party financing and then just leave it blank. You have to then have an addenda that's attached that has the speci specifications of that third party financing. Same with loan assumption and seller financing. Um, like I did say before, you might not know all that off the top. Uh, if you're doing a loan assumption, you might not know what they're paying when you put this offer in. You might not know what the seller is paying uh, in their mortgage, so you don't really know what you need to put down in the loan assumption addendum. However, uh, you will have to attach an addendum and let them fill it out, or at least <coughs> do this, send it over, let them give you the information, and then attach the addendum afterwards. But you will need that addendum in there at some point. Uh, also, with the cash portion of the thing, this is where your earnest money goes to. So if you're doing earnest money or option money uh, down, and that's going to, I mean, that will count towards your closing costs. Uh, what it goes to first is your down payment. So if we put in here that we're doing $50,000 in down payment and two fifty dollars in financing or whatever to make $300,000, you do not have to put, uh, if you put $3,500 in earnest money, that counts towards your down payment. So instead of $50,000, it would be $56,500. That, that's where that stuff counts towards, is towards that price or towards the down payment not to like the interest rates or not to the interest or the, the mortgage or anything like that. It goes towards the down payment first.
All right. Yeah, and um, with these addendums, if you were doing something that is usually around, I think a third-party financing addendum would be, uh, or not third-party financing, sorry, conventional financing, that would be about 80% of a, that's around what the conventional loan is, is you, you get a mortgage of 80%, you put down 20. Um, that would be around what a third-party financing would, would be used for, is around 80%. Um, that would be conventional, I know VA loans, there's no down payment, and FHA loans, you can do as low as 3.5% down payment. All of those, you would use this third-party financing addendum because that is a third-party finance you're getting it from. You're not getting it from the seller and you're not assuming their loan. So any sort of um, fixed-rate loan is going to be through third-party financing. Um, you can get it from seller financing, but that's, again, it's up in the air. It's not going to be around a certain number. For third-party financing, it's always around 80%. It's kind of what you're looking at. Um, Seller financing, they can kind of choose how much you're getting loan for. It's usually not going to be as much. I remember our hypothetical we did, like they were putting, they put down 73000 and they got 25000 in a loan. That's usually what happens with seller financing is you're going to put down more, like more than half and kind of get the other, you know, if you can't make up the full amount in cash, you might get a little bit in seller financing. You're not usually going to see, you know, 20% down, 80% financing in a seller financing. You'll usually see about, you know, it's like 10, it's like 20, 30 percent in financing is usually what comes out with seller financing. Um, and if you remember again with the third party financing, the cap and the interest rate is just whatever, um, I know I talked about this the other day, but the cap on the interest rate is going to be whatever the buyer is willing to pay that's available for the market, um, that's available in the market. You can't just throw out numbers. It's not going to be like 11% or something like that, it's going to be a rate the buyer will pay. Um, that's kind of like available in that in the market at the time. Uh, let's see, paragraph five. So earnest money and termination option. If you remember what we talked about this at the very beginning, earnest money, uh, how we talked about it's not cons it's not considered consideration. Uh, it's just showing your serious intent you don't have to put down earnest money. I've done transactions where they put no earnest money down. You don't have to do it. It just shows serious intent. Um, I've also done stuff where I just did a transaction with kind of a smaller piece of land where they did $250 in earnest money and then didn't do any option money because they're kind of 250 They were taking that where if they went half to do the transaction and they had to back out, they're only losing 250 because that's that was 1% of the sale price. So like, what does it really matter? There's no reason to put another hundred down for an option period. If I was not an option, then you just lose two fifty and came back out instead of the one hundred. So, um, earnest money and termination option or option money, those are not required. They're not like um, required, like pieces of a contract. Uh, they just show serious intent, which is helpful, and you will use them a lot. I, you will not, you will hardly ever see a contract that does not have earnest money or option money but they're not required as far as elements of a contract. And again, the money you put here, uh, or sorry, here, that's the stuff that'll go towards your down payment as opposed to, you know, the if, if they want a certain money back in expenses or something like that, if you have to, uh, I think it was in paragraph 12 where we have the sell and other expenses, if you put $5,000 here that the seller is willing to pay you, and then you have 3,500 here, it's not like you're gonna get 8,000 or 8,500 back and then you kind of figure out what to do with it. It's gonna to go towards your down payment. Oh, okay. Let's see. Yes, yeah, so if, if you do not get a seller's disclosure, um, remember this is kind of we like to always do this initially um, before we accept an offer. That way you don't get these extra seven days to back out. Um, if they do not receive her, you have within blank days, the buyer, the seller has to deliver this notice to the buyer, sorry. Um, and then whenever they receive it, they have seven days after they receive the notice to back out. That's again, if you don't have a seller's disclosure and somebody asks for no option period, they ask for five days here, they're technically going to get seven days of option period from whenever they receive the contract or receive the seller's disclosure. Sorry, 
And if you don't receive it ever, um, then they are allowed to terminate the contract at any point up to closing. Um, so if, this is very key that if you have a seller's disclosure, or it's very key that if they request one, you give it to them. Because if you don't give them a seller's disclosure, they're allowed to back out at any time um, prior to closing. Yeah, buyer has not received the notice by returning the contract in time prior to closing and earnest money, we refund it to the buyer. Oh, quick thing here. Um, so again, accepting the property as is, we like to always check the first box because you don't want to like miss out on the contract because you said yes, but I want you to, in the hypothetical, if you had like fix the four windows and replace the broken garbage disposal and stuff like that. That's something the inspector would also find. So you can just ask for that when your inspection comes back and they say, you know, we have these repairs that we would like to get fixed before the property, before we purchase the property. I would usually put that there, not in this blank, just because you know people are reading the contract and going, I don't want to do all that stuff, and then just not even looking at how much you're offering anything like that because you have some of your repairs you need finished. Um, and then if you do give it to a lender and they require repairs, unless otherwise agreed in writing neither party is obligated to pay for lender required repairs. That's very key. A lot of people think it's, some people think it's the seller because it's their house. So if the, if the lender requests it, they should have to do it. Some people think it's the buyer because it's their lender that's requiring it. So they should have to fix it. It is neither party. You get to kind of negotiate. It's, neither party gets to do it. So you have to figure it out. Um, and this usually includes the treatment of wood destroying insects. That's actually, you'll see that a lot. If ever we're destroying insects, that's like one of the, that's a very key thing that a lender was not getting a loan at that point. If you will destroy insects, a lender will say, nope, sorry. Um, you're either not getting a loan or they better fix that quickly and very, very efficiently. They can't just cover it up. They better fix it, fix it. And we'll go back and check again. And at that point, you might be able to qualify for it. But that's just like a big no-no for them if we're destroying insects. But again, neither party is required to fix it uh, or required to pay to fix it. Oh, for residential leases. So, um, or just for leases in general. Uh, so, fixture leases are going to cover leases over items or fixtures in the property. So, if you have a lease on a security system or a water softener or anything like that, solar panels, that'll have to be conveyed and you'll have an addendum that will actually transfer ownership of that lease to the buyer or at least notify them of the lease that's currently happening. Same with a natural resource lease, you kind of need to disclose that to the buyer, they don't move in, and then you realize after they moved in that uh, there's an oil vein under your property and there's a company that owns it, so they're going to be out there every other day drilling and they didn't realize that was the case or something like that. Um, that's a very drastic um, example, but you don't want that coming up, so that's why you have to acknowledge those. Uh, residential leases. Those will be such as the buyer's temporary lease and the seller's temporary lease. That comes down to, and they are temporary, so you can't, the, they only last three months or 90 days. I think it's 90 days is like specifically what they use. Um, not so much by month, but you can't stay, if you're staying longer than 90 days, you actually have to get a real lease. And you can get a short term lease that's like month to month or something like that, but you can't use a temporary lease in that situation. Also, if you remember the temporary leases are the ones that are, um, you have to pay them up front. So you have to pay the full price of your, if there's a security deposit, however many months, if you're paying three months of rent, let's say you're doing the full 90 days, security deposit and three months rent, that will all have to be paid up front at closing. If you're the seller and you're moving in afterwards uh, or you're staying in the property after closing and for a buyer, it's used if you're moving in early. So you'll, you won't usually see it for full like three months, um, but it just can't go more than 90 days in either direction. Again, usually closing is 30 days. So what you'll see this probably the most, I believe would be if you have a buyer who is trying to sell a house and buy a house and you know they put both days on a certain date that they're gonna sell and buy on the 15th or let's say, but then the sell of their transaction or their house goes really quickly. They end up selling on the 10th, but they can't purchase the next house until 
let's say the 20th. So one got moved forward two days, one got moved back two days. The buyer can then get a temporary lease at their property they're purchasing since they have nowhere to go right now. They can get a temporary lease for 10 days if the seller allows it and they can move in early. Um, however, at that point, you still, if you have a temporary lease, the seller becomes a landlord technically and the buyer becomes a tenant. So you have those qualifications, but that doesn't mean if you move in early, you technically like own the house early because you have possession of it. So you can start painting and moving things or whatever. You still don't own the property. Um, just because you moved in, you're basically moving in like you would if it was a rental property and you moved in, um, for example, I live in a rental property right now. I can't just go painting everything and tearing the walls down or whatever because I don't own the building. Same situation. You don't own the property. You can move in, you can move some furniture in, you can you know, whatever, but you're not allowed to like disrupt the property. I don't think it's in here, but um, I think I'm going through all these. Uh, if you remember in the new home construction contracts, they did talk about uh, the R value of insulation. That was referring to in new homes, they're putting in insulation at the time. So you have to actually give them information on what the R value is, the resistance value of that insulation. And that can be said the same thing. I know Aiden was talking about, he had a client that was that all he talked about when it came to windows was like the R value of the windows and the R value of this and that. And that's just the resistance to like either the heat or the cold um, and how insulated the property is. Um, yeah, brokers and sales agent disclosure, if you are related or you are closely connected to somebody that you were doing the transaction for and you're the agent for them, you have to disclose it in this paragraph. And this also states out that the broker's fees are contained in a separate agreement. And we talked about that was the buyer's representation agreement and the listing agreement. That is not going to be in this contract, even though um, right down here, you would put in your percentage, 3% or whatever. This actually doesn't count. This doesn't mean anything if there's already a previous thing in the MLS. Um, or another agreement, if you have a separate agreement between the brokers. And then for the selling agent, or not the selling agent, because that's the buyer's representative or whatever, but the listing agent, um, that their percentage is calculated in the listing agreement. So the listing broker has agreed to pay the other broker a fee of blank. That's because the listing broker um, will get a percentage in their listing agreement. And then on the MLS, that's where you can find out if you are a buying agent, you can find out how much they're going to pay you basically. <laughs> But this doesn't technically change anything. I know I said I had a, a agent that one time tried to change this up on me, and I was like, that doesn't really count because, and we had in the MLS that it said this. But then again, there was that one time Justin got burned because he wasn't paying, he didn't record what the MLS said, so they put something different here and then changed it on the MLS right afterwards, and then he didn't really have a way to look back at it. Um, oh, here you go. Uh, yeah, so closing, um, if you remember with the backup contracts, uh, you can't have more than one backup contract. That's very key. You can only accept one or else you're basically entitled to sell your house. Once this current one falls through, you're able to sell your house. Like three people have a contract that then is activated. So you only have one backup contract um, or else even if you did it in order, that's like pushing the last guy out like six months away. So that's why they only allow one backup contract at a time. And for closing dates, um, if that's what you put as the termination date in the backup contract that did them. So let's say that we have a property that will close on the, uh, the 30th. Now, let's say the 10th. If that property does not close by the 10th, then the contract we have uh, is terminated, so therefore we don't have, we're not stuck in this backup contract for any longer. But if they close on the fifth or they terminate it on the fifth, the new effective date of my backup contract becomes that date, whatever day I was notified of that. Um, if it's like April 2nd, I put it in 
and then uh, let's say April 2nd, the previous people started a contract. I put mine in April 6th, and then the previous contract was terminated on the 9th. My new effective date becomes the 9th instead of the 6th. So that's just something to remember is that they kind of, your, your effective date does not go off that because you still have to pay earnest and option and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and you have your, let's say you put 10 days for option period. That way, if they close 10 days after you put your initial offer in for a backup, you don't like lose your entire option period because, you know, if that was technically when somebody else was in the contract with them, it changes to become that day. So you have your option period from then on to do your due diligence in that point. Um, for possession, again, we probably always, you'll probably most of the time put upon closing and funding, but again, you can put according to a temporary lease uh, promulgated by Trek and, or another written lease required by the parties. That's where you would see that no more than three months out, either before or after that the new buyers will retain possession. Uh, smart devices, so a smart device means a device that is connected to the internet to enable remote use monitoring or management of the property. Items identified in a non real estate <coughs> addendum or items and officially assigned fixture lease assigned to the buyer. So if the seller has any smart devices that control anything that is technically in the property or items identified in the non realty items addendum or items in a fixture lease. So the reason it has this items identified by any non realty item addendum, if you decided that you want to put a non realty item in addendum in to keep their fridge, and they have some sort of smart device that controls their fridge, let's say, they can't then take the device that controls that because that's staying with you. So the device that controls them also has to stay with you. If it's a, um, if it's like a phone and you have, you know, you're an app that controls your thermostats or whatever, you don't have to leave them your phone. That, I know when this came out um, on the new contract, there's a lot of people who were like upset because they thought that they had to give away their phone or whatever, you just have to give them access to that stuff. So if it's a device that can be connected, you know, you can disconnect it, reconnect it, then you have to disconnect it from your device and connect it to them, their device. If it's an account, it's all under and you cannot change the account, which is very unlikely because people now know that this stuff can change property. So it's not going to be something that's stuck. Um, to like your internet account, let's say, or your Google account or whatever. But if it was, if you had an app that you had an account for that, that device is under, you basically have to give them either the username, password, or whatever to give them access to that account. Um, a lot of times, if that's your client, you'll just tell them, change it to something really simple. Just change it, your your username to something simple and change your password to one, two, three, four, five. Give them access to it. That way they can go in and change it to their own unique thing. And then you just kind of move on and that way you're not giving them if you, I know we're all supposed to have different passwords for everything. No one does. Nobody does that. Um, everybody uses the same like <coughs> two, maybe three passwords for everything in their life. So you don't want to give them one of those passwords because you have to give them access to a smart device. Um, so that's just key there. For special provisions, insert only factual statements and business details. You can talk about business details and you can talk about factual statements. Um, you cannot give legal advice you cannot put anything in special provisions that talks about uh, that is in an addendum. You can't say you want to keep the fridge and this and that because there is a non realty item addendum for that. So you cannot like put that stuff in special provisions. You can only put factual statements or business details. Um, the only time that you can put something different is like I said, if you're doing something like what's what special provisions is used mostly for is for situations where like the legal description is too long or what you want to put in a certain paragraph is too long. So you put refer to, to paragraph 11 and then put that stuff in there. That way you just get a little bit more room to type stuff out because it's a, it's a bigger blank. Um, but you're not going to put anything in here um, that gives anybody certain rights or you're not going to say, uh, be, be warned there's, there's a possibility of lead based paint in the property because it's built before 1978. You're not going to say that here because there's an agenda you literally attach and send to somebody that has that exact information in. So you're not going to put anything that's in an agenda right here. 
Another thing you're not allowed to do, so you can talk about factual statements and business details. You are not supposed to talk about like the title itself or the legality or where the title is at in the process or whatever like that. That's not your job. Um, that would be the title company or an attorney. Um, the broker is not going to know about it. Nobody's going to know about it except for an attorney if they ask for one. If they want opinions on title, that would be something that they would get an attorney for. Um, that is not your job, and it's nobody in this office who's the job. It's not going to be Justin. To, we don't know any of that stuff. That's not for us to know. That's that's an attorney or title company. Remember, you have to check off the boxes for the uh, for the addendum. You can't just leave them blank. If you leave them blank, they are not they're not notified as part of a contract in a court of law. So, if I was to not click the third party financing addendum or the addendum for a backup contract um, or something like that, if I don't put in let's see addendum for concerning rights to terminate due to lender's appraisal, if I didn't click this box here. And then the appraisal came back and said it was less than what it is. Let's say we thought it was a three hundred fifty thousand dollar house. The appraisal said it was three hundred thousand. The lender is not going to approve the funds for three fifty because that's not what the house is worth. So he's not going to approve those funds. If I don't click this box, we no longer have the right to terminate the contract because of that. Um, so that's something you really, really want here if you have it, because then your your client has the right to get out of a contract. Um, even though, you know, if they said they want to do it because of the appraisal, you have to put the box, even if you attach the document to it, if you don't put the box, they don't look at it or they don't read it. So that's very key here. Um, 23, it's the same in every contract, just what the attorneys are. Um, I'm trying to think of this. Anyway. Yeah, like I said before, uh, paragraph two is actually the only one that's going to be different in every contract. Um, three is going to be the same every time. The leases, again, they will be different. You have some that don't have residential. Um, if it's just unapproved property, you're not going to have a residential lease prop, you know. And if it's not, if it's a condo, you're not going to have natural resource leases. But there are a lot that are similar. The, uh, for example, the one to four family and the new home and the farm and ranch are all going to look just like this. So uh, the new home complete, not incomplete, but are all going to look exactly like this. So that's something, you know, these all look the same. Paragraph two is the only one that's completely different in all of them. All right. And I did want to bring this up just to remind y'all, if y'all want to change anything, the best way to change a contract is to use an amendment. You're not going to write a letter to title or write a letter to the seller or whatever saying, hey, we changed this. You have to use an amendment. And what this does is it's a promulgated form that will, um, yeah, it's a promulgated form that basically has all the things you would change. Um, and then also just other modifications. Insert only factual statements and business details. This again would be if you decided that, hey, we're going to be out of town, can you leave the keys blank? Um, that's something you'd put in this one, but you're not going to, again, you're not going to change their legal rights or whatever in this box here. And if you want to change the closing date, just check that and change the closing date. That's what paragraph nine is, is the closing. And so that's the best way to change a contract is going to be using an amendment because you have to, you have to have it, you have to have an executed date, and then you have the buyer and seller sign it. You can't just write a letter because then what if the other party didn't get it? They probably didn't agree to it if you just wrote a letter and sent it the title. It's not showing they agreed to anything. So this would be the best way to do it. All right. Does anybody have any questions so far? So make sure everybody's good. Half on to this a little quickly, but that's okay. No big deal. All right, cool. Um, for these offers, again, this is an offer. I know this is a wonderful family contract. We don't have like an offer contract. We just have this. One way to terminate a contract is to rescind it. 
Um, that's kind of the one people always forget is that you can just rescind a contract. That would be used if you were a minor, let's say, and you wanted to just say, by the way, contract's void. And you, that's kind of just you terminating it because it's voidable. Mostly what you'll see res like rescinding a contract is if I was to offer a contract and then anytime like kind of prior to the seller, the seller accepting it and notifying me, because again, that's when the contract is accepted is when they've accepted it and they've notified you that you accepted it. I can send an offer to Aiden for his house for great for thousand dollars. And before I hear back from him, I can just send another email and say, Hey, by the way, not anymore. JK, lol. Um, that, you know, I'm rescinding that contract. I'd like to rescind my offer for that property. That could happen. You won't see that a whole lot, but if you have a client that likes to just jump on things, they might just jump on it and then be like, Oh, I didn't want it. Or, jump on it and then go, oh, that was actually, I put way too much in that offer or something like that. Um, another way you'll see that is if you as an agent made a mistake and typed out the wrong number, you put in an offer for $3 million on a $300,000 house, you'll probably be messaging them being like, hey, I'd like to take that back now, please. Um, so that's another way you can do it before you accept it. Uh, let's see. There is no, I don't know how to word this, what I'm thinking. Um, a one to four family contract would be used to purchase a house uh, in fee simple. So you would use that for a townhouse or for a, a one to four family, like single family house that like we think of like just a normal house. So townhouses and normal houses, like I say normal houses, you know what I mean? We'll use a wonderful family contract. Everything else we use, or condos, we use a condo contract. Apartments will most likely use a condo contract. Um, however, that is what you would use to purchase a house and have fee simple title to it. I know we talked about fee simple title before, but basically that's just you have full ownership. You're not. Um, you might have a mortgage on it, but you still have full ownership of the property. You're not like co-owning it with somebody or anything like that. Fee simple just means it's your property. But there's probably other forms of that. That'd be what the wonderful family is. Um, let's see. Third party financing addendums will, will be probably the form for like conventional loans, FHA loans, VA loans, stuff like that. Um, there's seller financing and loan assumption that will all be like promulgated forms. All the stuff we've gone through has been promulgated. Um, but there are other ways to purchase a house. Um, I know my dad did a purchase of a house using a contract for deed where basically he just put a contract in to request the deed to a property and they just kind of switched. They gave him the deed of the property, kind of like they would a car in a way, like you can just receive the title of the car, the deed of the car or whatever. Um, that's not a promulgated form. That's just requesting to a contract for deed is kind of just a form you use to basically it's not as promulgated because it's not as extensive. Instead of 11 pages, it's very short and it's just kind of like a can I have the deed and get here you go. It's very quick. So it's not a promulgated form extra. Um, but yeah, any of the stuff we've covered that will all be promulgated forms. <coughs> There are two statutes that we talk about in this class and you'll probably hear in every class. The statute of frauds, it basically says that everything needs to be in writing to be enforceable. Um, and it has to be signed, writing and signed by, by the parties to be enforceable. Um, and the statute of limitations we talked about, which is basically you get a certain amount of time after an offer or after something has been done to be able to sue for it. So how we talked about, you can sue for a specific performance or for um, damages, stuff like that. There is a statute of limitations for that. That statute of limitations is four years for everything in writing. So if you have a statute of frauds, everything needs to be in writing. You have a contract that's in writing. You have a statute of limitations of four years for that contract because um, that is the statute of limitations for anything in writing. What that means is that if Aiden puts a bid on my house, he puts an offer in, I accept it, we go through contract, and then he tries to back out and disappear or whatever, and I want to sue him, 
If this happened today, I can sue him on April 29th of 2025, and it still happened. So I can sue him for specific performance in four years from now, and he would still have to purchase. I can sue him for specific performance, and they can purchase my house in four years. So that is why the limitation, it seems super long, and I feel like it is because of that, but you also want to be able to cover your ground, and if you miss anything, you know, you want to make sure you have the ability to go back and do that. It's four years for anything in writing, and it's two years for anything, any sort of oral contract. That's also very important. Um, people think it's four for everything, but it's actually four for anything in writing. It's for everything in writing is four years, and it's two years for anything like any sort of oral contract that you have. Uh, if you remember, there are six contracts that are promulgated by Trek. Um, pull this over here. So this is the amendment to contract. So that's what I was just looking at a second ago. Um, but you do have the farm and ranch, the two new homes, the wonderful family, the condominium contract, and the unapproved property. So you do have six um, contracts that are promulgated by Trek. And then, now that I think I should probably pull this up. Oh, there you go. Okay. There are also, um, I know I brought this up in class, but there are two resale certificates. That's a question I remember saying on my real estate exam, so I just thought I'd bring that up to you. But basically, there are two resale certificates promulgated. That's the condominium resale and the subdivision information, including resale certificate, property subject to a blah, blah. This is the one, if you remember, that the um, the member of the HOA will fill out, somebody from the HOA will fill out, whether it's like the president of the HOA or whoever, they'll fill this one out to kind of give you information on how much, kind of clarify the information, how much you're paying and how much, what you get, what amenities there are, stuff like that, um, what all the rules are for the thing. That'll all be in this uh, resale certificate here. And then condominium resale certificate, that is the same thing, only instead of by somebody from the HOA, that's from somebody from like the complex, like the condo complex, so somebody who owns like the, I think it's still called like a property owners association or something like that. Like that. The owners association of the condo, um, that'll tell you basically what the fees are as far as if you have to pay for maintenance fees, if you pay for community areas, stuff like that. It's the same sort of thing. The both resale certificate that somebody, a third party will fill out to kind of let you know what fees and stuff like that you're getting into with the property you're purchasing. Um, real quick, just about contracts in general. Um, if you think about what a contract is, a contract is just um, a promise for a promise. So that's really all a contract is, is just somebody promising somebody to somebody else and then promising something in return. You can have unilateral contracts, which would just be, I promised Aiden something, and that's it. And we just have a contract that I will do the thing. Um, that is what option periods and stuff like that are. If you have an option to terminate, that's something the buyer gets for those, let's say, 10 days. The buyer is not promising anything in that situation, but the seller is promising that they have X amount of days to terminate from their option period. Um, you might think it's bilateral because they're promising to allow you to terminate and the buyer is promising to pay them the option money, but technically by paying the option money, you're creating that contract. So at that point, you're not promised to do anything, you've already paid. So that is why it's a unilateral contract. Um, same with an option to purchase. The seller is basically just promising to sell you your home, but you have an option to purchase it. That's kind of what a, um, an option to purchase is. That's from the buyer as well. They have the option to purchase it or not. But the seller is promising to have to sell their house to them if it comes down to it. So, <coughs> oh, I guess for all these contracts in general, um, all of the contracts are promulgated by Trek. So Trek promulgates them. Trek makes sure. They kind of organize them and they promulgating is basically this they accept them to be used in the legal documents. However, it's the broker lawyer committee that writes the contract. So 
uh, the author of all these contracts is the broker lawyer committee. Trek just kind of promulgates them. And then Trela is the act that enforces them. They basically enforce all the licensing rules and everything like that. So um, the broker lawyer committee authors all the contracts, Trek promulgates them, and then Trela enforces them. That's really confusing, but you will see those a lot. The reason I'm saying that is I, you will see those acronyms on your real estate test. Um, the only one they will probably write out is the broker lawyer committee. Everything else will be Trela or Trek. Um, they don't really put like TVLC or whatever. It's usually spelled out broker lawyer committee. But um, yeah, so broker lawyer committee writes some Trek complicated. As far as offers on a contract go, um, like I said, you can only have one backup offer accepted. You do, however, have to give the seller all the backup offers. You have to give them, every offer that comes through has to be given to them at a reason, at reasonable time. So again, if you get one at 8 p.m., you can wait till the next day. If you know they go to work from nine to five and you get one at 9 a.m., you can wait till five to give it to them because you know they're off work. That's a reasonable thing to do. You don't just send it to them immediately. However, if the seller has requested <coughs> that you don't send them certain types of offers, um, then you don't have to give them those offers, I guess. If, if they say, I don't want anything $30,000 less than what I'm asking for, then if you get something of $30,000 less, you don't have to show them that offer. Um, you have to give them all offers that are made to them uh, before they've accepted an offer. Once they've accepted an offer, you don't have to show them any more offers. But every offer that comes through before they've accepted it, you have to show them that. survey um if you have a survey done this is one of the things that a buyer might not receive beforehand even if there's a survey done on the property with a seller's disclosure like i said in the kind of forms section of the mls they might have like the um the seller's disclosure in that little like attached document section in the mls you won't often see a survey there. There might be one there, but usually they're not, and you have to kind of, you'll have to request those. That's why there's not really a spot for like, we've received it. Um, so basically, within blank number of days, the seller will furnish the buyer the seller's existing survey of the property um, and a residential real property affidavit promulgated by the Texas Department of Insurance, the T47. This is not promulgated by TREC, this T47, this is promulgated by the Texas Department of Insurance. All a T47 is, is kind of, it shows what's different than the survey. Am I right with that, yeah, well, yeah, it pretty much says that the seller, since the last survey that they were, they've received, nothing new nothing, has been, Nothing new has changed. Yeah. yeah. Um, and again, you don't have to change anything if you get something that's temporary. Um, me and my wife at our house, we just got a like seven foot by seven foot like temporary shed that we put in um, for Home Depot, just like a little plastic Tupperware rubber made shed. Um, we don't have to disclose that because we can just tear it down and move it. If we were to put a concrete slab in and put the shed on top of that, even though the shed might not be permanent, the slab is permanent. So we have to then get a new survey done to kind of record where that slab is in the ground. Um, so basically a T47 would just kind of guarantee that like, we have not done anything since the survey I'm showing you now, we have not done anything that has changed what's on the survey, where we haven't put in a pool that now will have to come out and resurvey, exactly what the survey says that's still correct um, to our property. So that is what that's for. Um, if the survey is not acceptable to the buyer's lender, the buyer shall obtain a new survey at 
blanks expects no later than three days prior to closing date. So three days before closing. Um, this is not a certain person. It's negotiable in the contract. It's usually the buyer, um, just because it's their lender that's not accepting it. So the seller's like, well, I gave you mine. I did my work. Like you're the, it's your guy that's not accepting it. So do you have to pay for it? So usually it's the buyer, but it's not always the buyer. It's just, it's, it's whoever's negotiated in the contract, not one or the other. And again, as a buyer's agent, I'll probably click seller and send it over to the seller. And if they don't want to fix it, cool. If it's not accepted, then I can just go get a new survey on the buyer's behalf and have the seller pay for it. Cool. But um, that's why it's kind of negotiable. But it usually will come back saying the buyer, even though it's a negotiable thing. Uh, the title commitment has to be within 20 days after the title commitment receives a copy of the contract. That's also kind of key because I have seen things where like I accept an offer, agent accepts it, everybody accepts it, you know, agent sent me an offer, I accept the offer, I tell him we've accepted it, but it's 8 p.m. We can't really send it to title now. So the 20 days after the title company receives a copy of the contract, that's kind of what happens within 20 days after receiving it. It's not necessarily after the executed date because, again, if we put the ex if I accept it to notify him, that becomes the executed date, even if the title company is closed on a Saturday or whatever. It's 20 days from when they receive it, not from the executed date of the contract. Uh, This blank here for title policy will 95% of the time be the same as this blank here for the option and earnest money. And remember, this is within three days of the effective date. So even if that day is a Saturday, let's say, or let's say it's a Friday, let's say we filled it out today, it's 6.30 or 6.25, whatever. We filled it out. Um, we can't send this to title yet because they're closed and it's the weekend. So they're not gonna be open until Monday. However, um, this is technically the start of the effective date that does not include if it ends on a, a saturday sunday or legal holiday it's moved to the next day but it is three calendar days so that doesn't include weekends um if we filled it out today you actually technically have friday um or i guess you'd have saturday it would be one day sunday would be two days monday would be three days if you do on monday um you would not count as business days and say well saturday sunday don't count so monday tuesday wednesday is due on wednesday it's technically due on monday and that is three days from today. Um, also, with this title policy, um, it's at the seller, the buyer, or seller's expense. Again, most things are usually negotiable about that, about who pays for what. Um, but like I said before, the title policy will be the same. It costs the same throughout the state. You'll have people who will change the title company because. They've worked with them before and they really like them. I know here we really like university title, but that's because they're always willing to come in and do lectures with us. Or um, we've had Paige, a really nice woman who works at university title, come in and like do monthly meetings and kind of explain stuff to us a lot. And so we really like the title company because they're just so personal and so nice. Um, I wouldn't change if a contract came in that said Aggie Land, I wouldn't like change it. Um, but you will get some people that really like one title company over the other, and so they will. If you put one person, they might request, well, actually, I want to use Paige at University Title because I really like her. I know she'll do really good work. I've used her a lot, whatever. Um, that is like a negotiable thing, but the policy is not going to change the price because if you remember, the policy is the same throughout the entire state. So whether you did it in Aggie Land or at University Title, it's going to be the same price, the same cost for a title policy. Um, that also goes for different counties. You can't really change the county of the title company because if it's in Bryan College Station, you're gonna have to use Brazos County, somewhere in Brazos County for the title policy. So it's gonna be within Brazos County. But if I did one here, I did one in Galveston, I did one in Dallas, and I did one in downtown Houston, um, all the policies are gonna cost the same because they're the same throughout the entire state.
Yeah. So, um, according to the kind of like preset writing of a deed, I just wanted to make sure that was correct. Um, that's something I remember from a real estate test too, was that the preset writing on a wonderful family contract says that it's going to be a general warranty deed. It doesn't have to be. If you remember, you can use a special warranty or a quick claim or a bargain sale or whatever. Um, but the the writing suggests it's going to be a general warranty deed. If it's going to be something different, that's you have to let title know that we don't have a general warranty deed. We'll be giving you a special warranty deed. Basically saying, if you remember, general warranty says there's been nothing on the property for the entire time of the property. Special warranty says there's been nothing, like no liens or anything put on the property since I've owned the property. So if I've owned it for four years, nothing has come on it for four years. Um, quick claim and bargain and sale are just kind of like, I don't know, deal with it. Um, there might be, there might not be. I'm not going to say nothing. You don't really want to deal with those, um, ever. General warranty is the best. That is why it's kind of in the preset right in here. Also, it's the one that's most common. You will mostly see a general warranty deed because most people have it. Um, it's just like a title for a car. Most people have a clear title for a car. Most cars have a clear title. Um, you do have some that are reclaimed titles. You have some that are refurbished titles, whatever. But for the most part, you have a clear title. In the same way, for the most part, you have a general warranty deed. That's kind of why it's in the kind of the black pre-printed language that we can't change is because it's what usually happens and it's the best one. Yeah, I guess with earnest money, uh, remember that you can't you can't accept earnest money and sue for something else. Um, if you've accepted earnest money, that's your like repayment of damages. Um, you can't accept the earnest money and then also sue them for a specific performance or for damages or stuff like that. Um, because you accepting the earnest money is kind of your payback for it. Um, even though earnest money not cover what happened, I, you know, you might have a situation where somebody put up two hundred fifty dollars in earnest money, caused a lot of damages. You could sue them for forty thousand dollars, but you've already accepted the two fifty in earnest. Therefore, you can't sue them for the rest of it. Um, which is why, as an agent, we like to just sue, or we like, we like, we like to sue. We like to just send over the. Um, a letter of release of earnest money and stuff like that. As soon as we, as soon as something happens, if somebody's going to terminate a contract, if Aiden, if I'm Aiden's agent and he wants to back out of a contract 15 days in, we only got a seven day option period. He kind of can't at that point without losing his earnest money, or they'll sue him. So if he wants to terminate, I'm going to send over a notice of termination along with a release of earnest money, and just hope that the seller like. The, the seller's agent will just get it, send it over, let the seller sign it, and we're good to go. Um, while he might have lost that two thousand dollars or however much it was, that's a lot cheaper than them suing him and making him purchase the house, um, or suing him and making him, uh, or suing him for damages. And there's all these you know different things they can sue for for that. So again, if they accept earnest money, I just try to send it over as quickly as possible because if they accept earnest money, they can't do anything else. I guess a paragraph too. Um, with the other contracts, if there is improvements and accessories, it's always going to be like how I said, currently installed. That goes for everything. Um, even in the farm and ranch, there's like there's not just improvements. It has residential improvements and farm and ranch improvements. It still goes for the same thing that they are all permanently installed things. So you're not going to have um, like you'll have stuff like. I think the thing that will be different on the, res or the farm and ranch improvements is you'll have stuff like barns or 
um, pens or stuff like that, you're not going to have more equipment that is still movable. You're not going to have a tractor. You're not going to have the yard equipment. You're not going to have the irrigation systems. You're not going to have the actual animals. You'll just have like fences and barns and stuff like that. Because um, again, that is all stuff that's permanently installed. So that's what's good. With the um, mineral rights and kind of like mineral leases and stuff like that, as far as mineral leases go and mineral rights, that's going to be stuff underground. So you're going to have like oil, gas, propane, stuff like that. You're not going to see um, like water. There is like a lease, like there, you can get a natural resource lease um, for oil, gas, mineral, water, wind, other stuff like that. So you can get a lease, like a natural resource lease for water, but it's not technically a mineral lease or a mineral right. You don't get water and wind as mineral rights because that's not stuff under the ground. You're also not going to see stuff on the surface. You're not going to see dirt. You're not going to see gravel, um, asphalt, sand, stuff like that. That is stuff on the surface, not under the surface. Even though you could argue that, like, well, the top layer of dirt is dirt, is surface, but then under that, it's all minerals. You're not going to see that in like a mineral, um, mineral estate as far as like you know what you would get in like a, a reservation of minerals. Um, you would just get oil and natural gases and stuff like that. Um, if you are using a power of attorney to s transfer a property, um, I understand this because we're actually going through this right now with my dad. Since my dad passed away, we, he has a lot of property, but like my brother is power of attorney, and so, or, or sorry, my brother is his. Uh, what are they called? I can't remember. He has an attorney that's a good friend of ours. That's his power of attorney he can technically transfer the property for us. And we're doing that kind of currently at the moment because he has some rental properties that we might not want to deal with right now. So we'd like to sell them, but he can't sign the paperwork even though he's the owner because he's not around anymore. So we have to have his power of attorney sell the property for him. That is allowed. Um, you don't have to have like another attorney at the closing table to like make sure everything goes okay. You don't have to have, it doesn't have to go through like a court system or anything like that. Um, all you basically need is like a document from the power of attorney that says what they're doing and says like the legal description of the property. Because again, since they're, it's harder to find out what they're talking about if you don't have, my dad can say he's selling uh, one, two, three main street. That's easier because if you just look at my dad's name, you'll find out what one, two, three main street is. Um, Cause you'll, you'll look at what he owns that's labeled as one, two, three main street. But again, with a legal description, it has to be very specific. And so a power of attorney, you would definitely need that to make sure that since that could be anything, because you don't know who he's the power of attorney for, um, you will need that legal description. That's why they require a legal description and the contracts is because just because I put Jim here, if Jim's actually a power of attorney for somebody else, I can't just look up Jim's name and then the address of 123 Main Street because that might not be it might not be Jim. I might be looking up a different Jim in a different city than on another one to Main Street. When really this is a Jim who's working for another guy, uh, like Tom or Aiden or whatever. Um, because Aiden knows one to three Main Street and he Jim's a power train. So that's why you would need the, that's why they request the legal description in this contract, just to clarify that a little bit. Um, oh, I guess with this, if this is what your paragraph three looks like, 
when you're fully done with the contract, just 250, 250, because um, you're banking or whatever, and you got that money just to throw out there from your checking account, because you're a G, um, you don't need any addendums. That's kind of the one situation where like, you can do an entire transaction with no addendums, is if you don't have any sort of financing, you're literally just paying cash for a property. This is also the only time that you can do house flipping. Um, how we said flipping was like a source of fraud, that's because most lenders require a certain time to live in a property. If I'm just paying $250,000 for a house and I'm paying in cash, let's say I'm paying $150,000 for a house and I'm paying in cash, I can pay that cash and then a month later sell it for $300,000 if I fix it up in that month. That's allowed because there's nobody requiring that I stay in that property for a certain amount of time. That's why it's not always fraud, and that's why you can have shows that talk about house flipping is because you technically can do it. You just have to get special privileges. You have to pay cash, or you have to get special privileges from lenders. Um, a lot of times, the shows that do house flipping, they might get loan for it, but they know their lender knows that this is what they do for a job, and they know they're going to get their money back, even if they're losing out on this. They're going to get another sale in a month, and they do it again, stuff like that. That's just a very special situation. Um, but yeah, if you're doing just the closing like this with just straight cash, there's no addendas that you need attached to the property. So that's very, very nice. <coughs> oh, you remember the federal housing laws? That's one thing that we talked about in kind of a later class, um, looking at my slides here. Um, that covers kind of one of the, the most, it covers what you think, um, sex, race, uh, ethnicity, gender, stuff like that. But one of the things people always forget is that it covers familial status. I know Justin talks about that a lot because, again, it's one of the most missed things, and that's something you'll probably see on your real estate exam because it's something a lot of people miss. Um, but it covers if you have kids or not, basically. Um, same with, like, that's what a HUD disclosure is technically for. Um, the Housing and Urban Development Disclosure covers you if you have children. That way you don't have, um, you don't have a situation where like people don't want you because you have a four-year-old and they don't want to do a four-year-old. Um, if you're buying a property and you're qualified, you're allowed to get that property. Um, weirdly enough, it does not discriminate against age or like sexual orientation. Um, that is something that I'm not in it yet. Basically, I'm assuming it will be at some point. Um, but that's not something they're kind of protecting at the time. Um, but kind of one of the newest ones is disabilities and um, familial status, or if you have children or not, basically. Objections, this is a negotiable time, amount of time. You know, you, I, usually 10 days, you can put in 20 if you want or whatever. And this is where we usually put in residential or rental use. Um, but if you remember the other day, this is where we also put in, um, they want to be able to put a pool in and they want to be able to uh, park their RV in their driveway. That's basically saying that if there's anything um, that encumbers the title or prohibit the following use or activity. So you can put that, an activity you want to do is put in a pool. If that is not allowed, there is some sort of, um, what's that called? In, can't the name of it now. People that don't allow mobile homes. Um, my mind is blank on it, but um, if there's anything kind of preventing you from like having mobile homes or putting this on a property or whatever, you put that in objections. That way, if it comes back saying, "Oh, actually, um, there are no mobile homes allowed," or "Oh no, you can't put a pool in here," or whatever, uh, you basically have this amount of days from receiving that notice to back out of the contract. Or so that's what goes in objections there. Oh, 
president of service contract. Um, I know I talked about this yesterday, and you might see something like this um, in your real estate exam. But basically, the buyer is the one purchasing a, a residential service contract or a home warranty. You might see it called. They'll probably put residential service contract on the test because that's like technically what it is. Um, but it might be easier to think of as home warranties because that's like kind of what it's generally known as. If we have it on like, we have home warranty forms, you only have residential service contract forms or like, you know, pamphlets or whatever. Um, it is the buyer that's purchasing it. Um, people think it might be the seller because if I put in here $700, it's not the seller buying a residential service contract for me for $700. It's the seller reimbursing me $700 so I can go purchase a home warranty, basically. Um, so just because this, the money that's in this blank comes out of the seller's side, that's just a reimbursement. And it's your, it's the buyer's job to go buy a residential service contract or a home warranty because they're living in the home that the warranty is going to be in. So that's what that's for. Operations. Um, you okay, Aiden? Yes. <laughs> stretch. Uh, operations. Remember that this, the wonderful family is one of the contracts that does not deal with rollback taxes. Um, I believe it's the wonderful family and the condominium contract don't deal with rollback taxes because if you're buying a wonderful family residential contract, it's already residential. So you're buying it residentially, whereas if you're buying a farm and ranch or an unapproved property or whatever, it might have been agricultural, you're buying it and turning it into a residential property, that's, you're changing the zoning on that. Um, same with new homes. The reason new homes are included is because even though when you're purchasing it, it's a residential thing, a new home could have just been built and three days ago, it was not residential, it was agricultural. So that's why rollback taxes are included in that as well in the new homes, just to cover that. Um, so it's the new homes, the farm and ranch, and the unapproved property, those have rollback taxes. The uh, wonderful family and the condominium do not have rollback taxes. Also, hey, yes. think fast. What can you never disclose to somebody? Uh, I said this the other day. The homeowner had AIDS. Yes, correct. <laughs> or HIV. Or I mean, HIV. The same yeah. thing. Yeah, same thing. But, but um, yeah, you cannot disclose if somebody has had AIDS or if um, somebody has passed away due to AIDS. That's not something you can disclose. It's just best to not. Um, I was talking to Justin about this. Like, you can disclose if there's been a suicide. If it, if they allow you to, you can. Um, if you're representing somebody, you have to disclose that. Stuff like that, you kind of have to disclose. You cannot disclose if there was a death due to AIDS. You can disclose if you want that the property is haunted. If you, I mean, if you feel like it and you want to tell people that, like, oh, by the way, this place has been haunted for 50 years, um, according to this, this, and this, you can. Um, that's permitted. But even if somebody tells you you're allowed to tell people that there was a death due to AIDS or that this person had AIDS, you can't. No matter what they say, it's just like you can't do that. It's against the law, and it's a, it's part of the um, fair housing laws. So you're not allowed to do that. And I know Miss Vita asked the other day about um, if there was a murder. That kind of goes the same with suicide. You can if you want to. You don't have to. And then also we were talking about um, oh, what was oh um, how you can't talk about if. Or you can't refuse people based on race or whatever, um, or gender. You can't, you know, like we talked about, if a certain person really doesn't like a certain type of people, like they don't like um, Hispanics or black people or whatever, you can't, if they don't want to show them the property, you can't allow them to basically say, well, I don't want anybody of this type coming in my house. You can't allow that. But the, or Vita was bringing up a good point on if it's a ex criminal or something like that, can you can you reject them because of that? And to be honest, you wouldn't know. There's no real reason you would find that out beforehand. Um, a lot of times with clients, I will get a like for example, if I'm 
asking to do a shot against somebody's property, I will text the agent or call the agent and say, hey, I have a client that's really interested in your property at 123 Main Street. Can we set up a showing for Saturday at noon? And if they say, cool, then we go. There is no, I don't tell them like, hey, I have a client that's name is this and they work for this company or whatever. Are they, you know, they just got out of prison and they want to go look at like You don't disclose that to people. You just, you just tell them you have a client. Um, that also keeps you in the clear of like, if you were to tell people like I have an Asian client or whatever, that can come off as you being you automatically discriminating against them because you're having to disclose that they're they're race to people, which you don't need to do. Um, so it can be kind of come off as like treating people weirdly um, and discriminating against them. So it's best just to not disclose it. So if it was an ex-criminal or whatever, you probably wouldn't know that at the time. Um, and it's not kind of your place again that comes back to slander how we talked about the um if somebody was uh they were part of a sexual harassment whatever you might be able to find that out but you're not even though technically you're allowed you're permitted to disclose that to people we request that you don't just because um if it's incorrect you don't want to slander somebody's name uh, if Aiden goes out talking bad about me saying that i'm a uh sexual I, I was a sexual harasser and i'm a molester or whatever and i'm on all these lists but then it comes back that they just got the wrong guy and it's not me but i can come back at aiden for defaming me and for a defamation of character and then it comes off very poorly on the agent and aiden in that case so that's why it's best even though it's allowed just tell them there's plenty of databases go look it up go look at yourself um but you wouldn't know that stuff Um, oh, another thing. The property has nothing to do with financial approval. I know a lot of people think that, I know I talked about it a little bit earlier, but like going off of the, um, what's it called? The, uh, the appraisal and how like if a lender does not approve of a property, they can require certain repairs and whatever. That does not technically change your financing approval or your financial approval. That changes like the home approval. Um, your financial approval basically they receive your like credit statements and your assets and your income they look at all that sort of stuff and then just find out if it's satisfactory or not. um but it has nothing to do with the home itself it has nothing to do with the property you're purchasing the financial approval just matters if you can qualify for a certain amount of money um that's what financing approval is whereas getting approval for a specific loan on a specific property that might come back to what is the property condition so Hey, do you remember where the notices are? What what paragraph that's on? No problem. So close. Yeah. Um, so if you remember, there's only 23 paragraphs. 23 is always going to be the attorney. Um, 22 is where you put in all the addendums. So the last three are actually, or not last three, the, the attorney's one, I wouldn't say is super key. You probably won't be asked about that. But as far as where the agreement of the, or the, uh, the addendums is, that's always going to be in 22 and 21 is always going to be the notices. I remember both those from my real estate test, people bringing up which one is the, like, where you have to check the boxes for the addendums. That's in 22 and 21. It lets you know where all these notices are going to be sent to. Um, so yeah, that's very key. <clears throat> just in general this these contracts you will never sign um you will put your name in notices if you go back okay okay <clears throat> sorry 
you might put your name here in the notices saying, um, I want the stuff to be sent to me instead of my client. They can send it to the client through me or care of me. <clears throat> However, you are never going to sign the contract. This is not a contract to bind you to anything. A purchase contract, which is what a wonderful family of farm and ranch, those are considered purchase contracts. Um, all of the purchase contracts are going to be a bilateral agreement between the buyer and the seller. Um, so that's not going to deal with the agent or anything. That's just a bilateral agreement between the buyer and the seller themselves. Your agreements, your signatures, and your contracts come through in the buyer's representation and the seller or the listing agreement, the seller's listing agreement. Um, that is what's going to deal with the agents and then the purchase contract. The agents are just filling it out on behalf of the of the clients and the buyer and seller. They're kind of the ones in the party. Um, they're the ones in the contract and the bilateral agreement. And anything not, um, and you remember bilateral, basically making a promise for a promise and a purchase contract is basically one's promising to buy, I promise to pay you this much money for your house, and the other person is promising to sell them their house. I promise to not accept any more offers and accept your house if everything goes hurt and uh, sell you my house if everything goes correctly, basically. Um, that is what this agreement is. So um, as far as the policy and the survey go, if you remember, there are basically all of these things um, that are going to be subject to promulgated exclusions uh, and the following ex exceptions. So these are all the exceptions to the title policy. With the commitment, like I said, it is 20 days and um, seller shall furnish the buyer a commitment of the title insurance. That is why it usually the commitment is paid by the seller. And then the buyer, um, at the buyer's expense, legible copies of restrictive covenants and documents uh, evidencing the dependence, exceptions in the commitment, other than the standard printing exceptions. That's all at the buyer's expense. So the buyer will pay for like the restrictive covenants and documents, basically. But the commitment itself and the policy, the policy is determined by either. It's usually going to be the seller, but it is a negotiable thing. The commitment is the seller um, within 20 days. With other types of sales, remember you can do a um, like a short sale. That's one of the other things that we talked about. That's not um, that wouldn't change this contract basically. Um, as far as the buyer side, you're not really involved in a short sale. You're just putting an offer on a house. That's kind of dealing with the seller. Um, but again, that is if the seller is trying to sell their house for less than what they owe on their mortgage. If they owe $280,000 is they had a $300,000 mortgage. They're trying to sell the house now, but it's only worth 250. dollars They're offering 250 dollars for it. They have to basically get that approved by the lender. So it's the seller's lender that has to approve whether the short sale will go through or not. Um, 
hours. Yeah. Then point on that too. Um, nothing in the contract deals with mineral rights. That's not something you put in a contract. That's what you put in the dicta. Um, so like a farm and ranch contract, even though it deals with a lot of land and stuff like that, unimproved property deals with land, only land, you would think they put something in about mineral rights, whatever, but it's really not in this case. It just, that would go in an agenda. Um, you get more stuff like crops and equipment, like I said, and like the leases and everything, but you wouldn't really get, um, and then also like, you know, who owns it, stuff like that. Um, but you wouldn't really get, um, actual mineral rights that would be stuff you put in that agenda for oil gas and whatever that's where all of your reservation of mineral rights and something like that goes is in that agenda that's about oil gas and other mineral rights Uh, I guess if the property is or is not in a homeowners association, now that I think about it, um, if y'all remember me talking about this during our agendas, I think it was, um, that is stuff that comes from the, the title company. It's their job to find the subdivision information. Um, I just did a contract recently where we sold some a bit of land that's kind of out in the middle of nowhere. And it came back to subdivision and I only knew like, cause I mean, cause on the CAD it had like a name. So I was like, I guess it's, and it was like something homes number four, like that was the subdivision name. So I was like, okay. So I just put that in. But as far as like information about the subdivision, um, that all comes back to the title company. It's not your job to find any information like that out. Your job is to fill out a contract and help them go through their process of doing inspections and getting an appraisal done and getting a survey and all that sort of stuff. But you're not the one searching for information. Um, it's not your job to kind of do title searches. So you're not going to find out certain information about the property and all that sort of stuff and the subdivision and everything like that. That's kind of the title's job. Your job is just to make sure everything runs smoothly as far as the um, due diligence of your party goes, so the inspection and all that sort of stuff. And then make sure the contract is correct and working. Oh, for the load-based paint that didn't know. Uh, think about it. Remember that it's before 1978. I know I've said that a whole lot, but that's because you'll get multiple questions on the real estate exam. I know everybody I talked to has had it. Um, that it's before 1978. So anytime they'll ask you if it's January 3rd or December 5th or whatever, it's just before 1978. So December 31st of 1977, that's when you have to, that's like the, the last day you would have had to disclose lead-based paint. And then also within reaching, it says in the, the addendum that if they received notice about it, they have 14 days to back out of the contract. So um, that's just something else to like, remember that that is a thing you have to fill out if it's before 1978 because it does give your buyer extra 14 days to back out if that stuff comes up. So it actually is really important. You don't want to miss it just because you're thinking, well, they probably, I can just tell them about it. I don't have to put the addendum in there. 
just because you can tell them about it doesn't mean that they won't get the extra days to back out and everything. So it's nice to, to have them actually know that they get those 14 days extra. Thought about that because I was talking about the um, the broker's fees and how that's listed and everything else. It's like it's not in the in the contract itself. It is, however, weirdly enough, in the farm and ranch contract. I don't know why. Um, because I was thinking about that because I just did a farm and ranch contract. And I remember being like, I had to put all these boxes and stuff like that. It didn't just say three percent. That's because for some reason it actually is in the farm and ranch contract. Um. That you, upon closing the sale of the buyer of the property, um, the blank will pay listing principal broker cash fee of blank or blank percent of total sales price, and the seller buyer will pay the other broker cash fee of blank or blank percent of total sales price. The seller buyer authorizes and directs escrow agent to pay the brokers from the proceedings at closing. I don't know why that's in this contract and no other one. I've never quite understood that, um, but that is in here for some reason. So. Every other one, it says this is a percentage you can put in, but you don't have to because it's in the it's in somewhere else. But for some reason, the farm and ranch it makes you put it again, and it's actually binding in the farm and ranch contract. I don't know why. Um, it's just this one contract that has it. So um, I found that weird. But yeah, and here's what I was saying about the farm and ranch improvements and the farm and ranch accessories versus just residential accessories. So like the improvements. That's going to deal with um, pens, fences, gates, barns, tanks, windmills, like the, the big stuff that's permanently installed, not just um, like irrigation equipment, fuel tanks, submersible pumps, pressure tanks, stuff like that. It's going to be like big stuff that's permanently installed on the property. Are you ever allowed to give legal advice? No. If somebody asks you if you want to give legal advice, just tell them to talk to an intern. Um, it's kind of the easiest thing to, to get them back. Like, there's no reason you should ever do it. And like I said, the closest you can come to ever giving legal advice is if you accidentally start putting things in special provisions that changes um, their rights. So if, you st if it's not just factual statements, but you're actually getting we want this to happen or we get our earnest money back when we get terminated the contract for this many days or whatever. That's just <coughs> adding stuff to the contract. You're not allowed to do that because you don't, you can't practice law. So you'd have to, have to advise them to consult an attorney if uh, you want to define stuff that like, not define stuff that, but uh, put in legal remedies or whatever. Um, another thing that you can get caught for, I know Justin said he got caught for this a oh, a lot is using legal wording. Um, legal language is its own language, and you cannot use legal language. Also, stuff like time is of the essence, that is a legal language. You cannot put in special provisions. We want to know if we can put in a pool, and also time is of the essence for you to give us that information. That's you practicing law because you're using legal language in that. Um, so just don't, you don't want to throw anything, you want to be careful you're not using legal language when you use stuff like that, like time is of the essence or whatever. Probably good to know what the seller is going to 
like because this is stuff that you can't this is one of the few times that there are it's not negotiable who pays for what like i said a lot of times like the title policy you can kind of take who pays for that and it's negotiable but the seller will always pay for stuff like the um recording fees prepayment penalties um tax statements or certificates preparation of deed stuff like that um i don't tax statements and certificates it's kind of like people don't realize that but if they want to get a tax statement it's the seller's pay for it because it's still his property <coughs> um same with like recording fees from title it's the seller who's choosing to sell their house yes you're putting in a purchase contract to purchase it you're you're putting the option to purchase it but the seller did not have to sell it so it's kind of his job to if he has to pay prepayment penalties to his mortgage or whatever or uh recording fees or something like that it's the seller's job to have a tax certificate and um, statements uh, or a preparation of deed it's because it's the seller who's preparing the deed he chose to sell the property he chose to prepare the deed so it's his job to or it's his cost that he has to pull it up and get that stuff set up Does anybody have any questions about anything particular we talked about class or whatever? Because I think I've covered kind of everything on the contract that I can think of. Um, but if anybody has any questions, let me know. As far as the exam goes for next week, are we going to have to know, like, paragraph one, what does it have? Paragraph seven, does it include this? Not particular. I mean, it's not going like, to go through each paragraph and ask you. Yeah. Um, but there might be pair like you might get stuff that says like what's in paragraph three and it's like mm -hmm. the price and the sales price stuff like that um but it's not going to go it's not like you're going to have to put them all in order or anything okay. too complicated you might just get um what paragraph deals with the property itself paragraph two what okay. paragraph deals with um I got say what paragraph deals with the notice would that be 21 like stuff like so that. be familiar with be the, familiar with the it. title yes right? with the title okay. of it kind of what's included in it but you don't have to necessarily know each um you don't have to go through and know like let's see um not like the fine fine print yeah and you won't you won't really need to know like in title notices and that's g of paragraph six and then paragraph g2 stands for what like that sort of stuff you won't really have to know um the only thing I think of might be stuff like the residential service contract because that's just such an important part that or like the the seller's disclosure like that's in set and B that's the only time I can this is I'm even talking about the real estate exam itself because stuff like that is very it's like even though it's in seven B whatever it's a super important part of the contract yeah um, so like that stuff you might end up seeing on like a real estate exam but for the most part, you're just going to get like, what's in paragraph three? It's the sales price. Or if somebody puts this in the second blanket paragraph three, like they put in third party financing or whatever, what are they do they need? Like stuff like, you might get stuff like that, but you won't get anything super specific. Um, but I would advise before you take the test, even if it's just a wonderful family, just scroll through it, look at it, and just kind of get an idea of kind of remind yourself. 22 has the agendas, stuff like that. Um, that's probably just a good thing to kind of go through and remind yourself of, but I wouldn't say you necessarily need to know like these paragraphs, like all the ones in the middle that we kind of did that one day, um, you know, casualty loss and default mediation, stuff that's just like, there's nothing to fill in. That stuff you already need to know because there's nothing, it doesn't matter if 16 is mediation or 17 is mediation or whatever. That's not an important paragraph. Um, it's important because it's in the contract, but you'll need to know more of the stuff you're going to be dealing with, which would be more of seller's disclosure, paragraph seven. I'd say paragraph one to seven, um, maybe one to nine, because I mean, literally it's just brokers and sales agent and then the closing date and stuff like that. So probably one to nine, um, 11 special provisions. That's probably, you'll see that a lot just because a lot of other things refer to paragraph 11. And you'll probably get a lot of questions that say like what can you not put in paragraph 11 and it's like you can't 
add legal whatever, or what are you allowed to put? And it's like only factual statements because 11 is special revisions. So that's probably another one you probably should know. But if you can know, like, if you knew 1 to 12, because that's the stuff you have to fill in, and you didn't know 13 to like 20 probably, and then you 21, 22, and 23, you basically have the contract memorized because all the middle stuff is just notices that like you're not going to have to be with them. So that's what I would say as far as that goes. That is, um, that is a good, good point. As far as thinking back to, we were talking about um, disclosures of like suicide and stuff like that. Um, the only time you actually are required to disclose if there was a death on the property, like it's required, is if it's because of the property. Like if the roof fell in, fell on somebody, because it's they're buying a house that you know has a cracked roof, that sort of stuff you have to disclose. Or like if the property's in a there's a sinkhole that formed in the backyard, and like well, that's something that's due to the property. That stuff you that stuff you have to like you have to disclose because of that because you're basically warning them like this place is dangerous. Um, but as far as like suicide or anything like that, like that's not something that deals with the property. Um, but if it was like an accident because of the property, you're basically warning them that be safe. <laughs> it's kind of what you're doing. So that's something you have to disclose. So yeah, what good. if there was like an external force onto the property that killed someone? So like a lightning strike or that yeah. is not due to the condition of the property. Okay. It kind of comes down to if it's due to the, the, the actual condition of the property itself. Um I'm trying to think if that would actually include like flood zones, because if that's a condition of the property that's in a flood zone. Yeah. So I would think so. That's but as far area. as like <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 still weird area but like as far as like a lightning strike that can happen anywhere that's not due to the property yeah um okay. yeah it's just an external force but um like i said if like a wall fell over and crushed somebody well mm -hmm. house is probably shit i bet the foundation messed up whatever um even if they fix the wall <coughs> you're basically warning that like apparently the foundation is so unstable the walls can just fall over so this <laughs> is so, watch yeah, they fix that one wall watch out for the other ones so like it's just you have to kind of clarify stuff like that So that would be like gas or something, right? Like propane. Use. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. If um I can't figure out how to explain. Um oh if the um Called. If you have a contingency contract, I'm trying to think what that actual addendum is called, where you have like a uh, like an addendum for a previous sale of the other property or whatever. Um, if you have that and somebody else puts a contract in that's better and they might accept that, they can, but only if you refuse to waive your contingency and you back out. Um, if you waive your contingency, you are still first come, first serve. But you have to waive your contingency. If you don't do that, your contract's terminated and it goes to the next, the next contract. Um, I remember seeing that. That was very weird because they were talking about, um, they worded it very confusingly. Um, I don't think any of the questions on like this exam are like super hypotheticals that are weird. Yeah. But I remember there was like one on the real estate exam that talked about if this person puts in a contract, this person contingent on them selling their house to this other person. And then this other person puts in a contract with this person on this or whatever, and they got really convoluted. But basically, what it came down to is, if I put a contract in on Aiden's house, but it's contingent on me selling my house first, so I have the funds to buy his house, and then you put a contract in on Aiden's house, and he likes that contract more, he basically has to tell me, <coughs> "Hey, I received another one that I like more than yours. If you waive your contingency, we're still under contract. But if you don't, I'm moving on and filing with this person." That's kind of what I come down. And then I have like three days to waive that contingency. Um, and if I don't, then my contract's terminated and he's not under contract with you. So that's kind of a weird way that a seller can get out of a situation um, or get out of a contract they're in. Um, is if another contract comes through in a contingency clause that they like more and then I don't want to waive my contingency. And like Justin said, it's best not to 
because you never know what will happen. You don't want to be stuck in a situation where I waive my contingency, and then now I have to, and then that deal falls through, but now I'm still under contract to buy his house, and I don't have a contingency clause anymore, and I don't have any money because my house isn't sold. So it's best just to have your client be a little annoyed and have to back out of a deal and find another house. It's way better to do that and be in that situation than then having to buy a house with no money. So um, that's the best thing to do in that situation. How I said you're allowed to use other forms earlier. You are allowed to use other forms, but you'll see that mostly in is like if a but like builders sometimes have their own forms that they promulgated through like their own attorney. So if you buy a house from a certain building company, they'll probably have their own form that they want to use instead of like a new home construction form. Um, which sucks, but the best way to deal with that is just you have to notify them. Like you have to notify um your buyer about like title and everything and the abstract title because a lot of times their form won't cover that stuff. Um, but you have to notify them and there's like even a I think it's just called like a notice of or notice to like buyer notice to buyer form or something like that, notice to prospective buyer, something like that. That's the form you would use to notify your buyer if a building contract like some other non promulgated contract came through because they don't have all the required notices in here. Um, speaking of notices, we were on, um, they won't have all of this stuff. But you have to give your clients this information somehow. Um, and since they don't have this stuff, you'd have to basically give them a notice of title or notice to prospective buyer. Um, and it's just basically a form that just has this stuff on it. Just a promulgated form that's just those notices that you have to give them because they have to get it. They have to get it in some way. Question. Yes. What were the two notices that you always keep on hand for potential clients or something? Good point. Okay. Called? The we call it the CPM or CPN. It's the consumer information notice, um, and that is the one that has to be displayed in a broker's office or in somewhere. Um, if you have a website or a Facebook page or whatever, like if we went to Nobles Realty Group's Facebook page, there is a copy of the C, the consumer information notice on that page because you have to display it basically everywhere. Um, so this, the CPM or the consumer information notice has to be there. And then the IABS or the information about brokerage services. Now the IABS has to be disclosed once you start having like substantial discussions or substantial discussions. Um, so if I show Aiden a bunch of houses, I don't need to give him one, but if he wants to put in an offer and he starts talking seriously about what he thinks they would offer or what they, what he thinks they'd take and blah, 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 that's when I have to give him the IABS form. But the CPN, I have to give him any time, because even if I show him one house, we don't talk a lot, but he needs to write a complaint about me because it's something I did at that one property. He has to know where to go to do that. So the, C, the CPN or the CIN has to be disclosed basically everywhere. That's why it's required if you... On that shelf when you walk in our door here in the office that little shelf in the corner just to the right of the door that has a copy of the, of the consumer information notice on there because we have to dispose it somewhere in the office or display it somewhere in the office that was a really good question
Sorry, guys, I'm kind of jumping back and forth. Um, for the seller financing addendum, um, thinking back to the prices, uh, I guess this is the seller contract. Same thing there, but the other contract. Um, Remember that seller financing is when you are basically getting a finance or you're getting a loan from the seller. Loan assumption is when you're taking over the seller's loan. And third party, you're using a different, you're using a third party. You're using somebody who's not involved in the contract at all to get your loan. That'd be a lender. Um, with seller financing, remember that you have to still give them credit approval. It's just not as, it's, it's not the same, they don't have the same formula. So with the third party financing, you give them a credit score or you give them they will find your um, income, your credit score, all that sort of stuff, and then your assets and base that to give you a percentage. You, uh, your mortgage is gonna be at what percent? Um, I had a client who, at first, they were like working to qualify, but they had plenty of assets, it's just the credit score wasn't good. And then they worked the credit score up for they, uh, they qualified for it and they could get a loan. But then me, them, and the lender were kind of talking and figured out that if they actually worked their credit score up a little bit more, which is easy for them, because again, they have plenty of assets, just their credit score wasn't good. But he was like, if you listen to me and you pay off this, this, and this, I can work your credit score up a little bit more and that'll lower your interest rate and you can get a better, your finance will be better. Your, your monthly payment will actually, I think they said it was going up by like $300 per month just by having way like another two months to improve their credit score. Um, seller financing will not have that. Basically, you give them um, your credit documentation, everything like that. Um, if you don't, the seller has three days to base, or not three, sorry. If you don't, the seller has seven days to terminate the contract because you haven't given them credit approval. Um, but if you do give it to them, that doesn't change what the percentage is. If they say 7% or 8%, like I think Aiden said the average around town is 7% for seller financing, uh, which is much higher than the um, third party financing. If they chose seven percent, even if you have an if you have an eight hundred credit score or if you have a six fifty credit score, and both of them qualify, it's not going to change your your interest rate at all. It's still going to be whatever they said, seven percent. That's why third party financing is usually a little better, is because it kind of it can change depending on how much you, or how good your finances are. Whereas seller financing, they tend to just accept it or not accept it, um, but you have to deliver them that information. And if you don't, they basically have seven days to like back out of the contract. Um, the seller does, because you didn't, you, you haven't proved your credit worthiness to them and everyone's giving you a loan. So it's a little bit different from third party financing in that way. Um, I was talking about, um, you can, purchase a house and then sell it for more money or flipping. That is allowed if you purchase it in cash for like how we put up here, 250, um, say or, 250. Or if you like agree with the loan. Yeah, or yeah, yeah if you agree with the lender or anything like that. However, you cannot do this, like if I was to buy a house and let's say I purchased it at 150, it was appraised around that, I went ahead and purchased it at 150. I might be able to sell it at 190 or 200 because I'm flipping it. I might have fixed it up a little bit, you know, whatever, made some improvements to it. I can sell it for what it's appraised at. I cannot, however, take this $150,000 house and then get it appraised for a million dollars because I know a friend who's an appraiser and they decided, yeah million dollars you can do it and then i sell that house for a million dollars so i got a, i got a story yes not that much of a story but i saw one of two Joanna Gaines' flips on realtor and it was sold for millions of dollars mm -hmm. it was like that one shot going home that was super small like one bed one bath but there's no way so <laughs> yeah like that but also yeah. it was so on like, tv you so. can you can flip it and if people like it i mean people, like, you're allowed to do it. You just can't use like false appraisals for it. You can't have a friend that's an appraiser. And like how Adam Justin Aaron was talking about, like 
if I'm doing a deal with him, he knows an appraiser, he'll slip her some money, and then he knows an inspector that can be like, yeah, how's it good? He'll slip him some money, and then suddenly we're all walking away with a, a big paycheck or whatever. Um, you can flip houses. And again, if some people, it might be appraised more because they used it, because they flipped it, and people just, and the same with like, if you think about like shoes, if somebody, if they're Jordans, they might not be worth more technically, but they can be appraised for more because they're Jordans in the first place. Like, same sort of thing can happen with houses where the appraisal might actually be higher because of the chip and Joanna game. So when they think about how much is this house worth, it might be higher than what it should be, but that's because that's what will, people are willing to pay for it, and they know that's what people are willing to pay for it. Um, you can't just take a crap house, put some new flooring in it, and call it a million dollar house because nobody's willing to pay that. So that's why you can't have fake false appraisals. Um, but you can have a name attached to it that might help. So that's what that would be. <coughs> I never thought of that. Of like, oh, I thought it was so get, funny. Yeah, I never thought about it. Like once you get like popular, you can just sell your houses for more and more and more and more yeah. because people would be willing to pay it because it's pretty sure they spent like one eighty something like really really low. Yeah, because of how small the house was. That's so crazy. Yeah, I think I also saw like the bar money at some point on there for obviously even more. Even more. That's ridiculous. But. Yeah, but it's just like it's in Waco, so all the houses are like really low, and then there's theirs. <laughs> that's so. That's so. That's so well, weird. it's it's true. Yeah, yeah. And the neighborhoods they usually have their flips in are also pretty low because yeah. they buy it low. Yes. Yeah. But then it just shoots off the roof. Yeah, that's so great. Congrats, you did seven seven thirty. I did. Yeah, that's great. Um. Let's see if there's anything else. Before we leave, let's kind of try to double check if there's anything else we need. Um, Have we figured out a day that we're going to take the exam? I was kind of going to talk with y'all about that if y'all could think of anything else. Um, I don't know if Thursday evening worked for most of y'all last time, if y'all be willing to do that again, and then I can just find another time for the people who it didn't work out for or people who wanted something different. Um, it probably have to be on the same day. Um, either that or maybe the next morning, just so like there's no, I don't know, We're trying to find a way to do it without there being like a two day gap so everybody can figure out the answers to it from one person or whatever. Um, but like my thought was either doing one that'll end right before class and then starting one right after class or something like that. Um, but that's what I was going to ask y'all about to see if y'all want to see if y'all can do one. Maybe Thursday, um, if you have two hours started at 3 3 30 and then do the test half class and then we can do the test right after class on thursday at uh 7 30 and then go from 7 30 to 11 or whatever um super long super long test so if that works for y'all that's kind of what i would like to do just to make it a little bit easier for everybody but <clears throat> if y'all have any other ideas let me know i like that you like that idea yeah okay that's Did you repeat that? Yeah, so, don't mind. Yeah, no, no um, I'm gonna try to have a test <laughs> Thursday afternoon, so around three or so. That way we can have the test and then have class right after it. And I'll just mark off like who's taking the test then. And then whoever is not taking the test before class will have a test right after class at 7.30 or 7.45 whenever we get around to it. And that'll be when um, everybody else has to take the test and you have to take it on that day in one of those two times. Um, I figured everybody made it last time on Thursday. You can make it again, but just if you didn't like that time or could, wanted to do something a little different, there's another option for you. Um, I know like I kind of hated taking it oh, I really did. so late. Um, it was awful. I totally understand that. I'm a person that I would, I'm a night person. I stay up till like 3 a.m. So like I could totally take a test at night and be totally cool with it, but mm -hmm. I know I'll go work like that. So, um, yeah, so I'll probably try to have one Thursday at 3.30 or 3. I'll kind of give you all a better time next week during class when I kind of finalize how long it's going to take and when I should actually start it. Um, but probably around 3 and then do another one at 7.45 or whatever right after class. So that is my plan. Thank you. No problem. All right. Down for everybody. I think we kind of covered as much as I can. There's not much else to go through. So um, I spent two hours covering it. So I hope, hopefully I covered enough. <laughs>
Um, but if y'all have any other questions before the test, feel free to let me know. I'm not going to be here during class starting Monday. Aiden's going to be teaching, and Stefan's going to be kind of working the computer. Um, and I'm going to be on vacation. Um, yeah, yeah, chilling and, and on the beach or something. I don't know. I'll be around town. It's not going to be in class. Um, so if y'all have any questions, you can always text me. Um, I know I'm trying to get with some of the students who took the class last time because since the contracts have changed, there was everybody who took the test or took the class in, I guess it was January, the beginning of January yeah. when the class happened. Everybody who took the class at the beginning of January, who then finished up into March and then haven't taken their test yet, they still have to go through the whole, like, I need to teach them all the new contracts because that's on the test map. So I'm getting with people around town and doing that anyway. So I'll kind of be still doing this. So if you have any questions, feel free to let me know. I'll be more than willing to help out and kind of clarify some stuff here and there. Um, but I would advise, like I said, before the test, just open a contract and go through it. Maybe open some, if you have some of the old slides open, just kind of scroll through them and just try to memorize some stuff. Um, I don't think there's anything I didn't cover today that I can think of that'll be on the test. So if y'all have any questions, let me know. Um, and like I said, scroll through a contract or two and just kind of get familiar with them. That'll help you here. That'll help you in the real estate exam. That'll help you in all the other classes because we kind of we bounce back and forth through this stuff. And then that'll also help you on the um, like the actual test and in the job once you finally get to it. So other than that, uh, I will see you all Thursday. But starting Monday again, we'll have Aiden here teaching. So he will see you all Monday evening. <laughs> all right. See you later. Bye. Bye, Vida. See ya. Yeah.